Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. I have uh, Dr. Jennifer Wood. She goes by Jen. Uh, she's an, uh, an associate lecturer at uh, in the Department of Physiology, Anatomy, and Microbiology at La Trobe University in Australia. I've interviewed a number of people from La Trobe. It's a great university with a lot of really interesting uh, researchers there. So, Jen, thanks for coming. How are you doing? No, yeah, my pleasure. I'm well, thank you. I hope you're well too. Yeah, I'm yeah, doing fine. <laughs> so you you uh, you just started heading a lab, uh, the Applied Environmental Microbiology Group, right? Yeah, that's right. So I've um, just started this year as the co-laboratory head there. So the lab itself has been going for a little while. And um, it's a really neat lab because we have a lot of projects going on. Um, but the way we're working it at the moment is my, my co-lab head is managing a lot of the environmental microbiology projects that look at um, human and gut health. And then I'm heading up all the stuff that's out there in the environment, all the projects that look at um, soil health or microbes in things like uh, you know, corrosion and you know, ecosystem resilience, that kind of thing. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was going to ask you specifically, what are some of the uh, interesting pro- projects that you're intimately uh, involved in? Yeah, um, like I say, there's a breadth of them. So um, the idea that underpins all of them is can we use microbes in a way to sort of you know, manage an ecosystem and you know, whether that ecosystem is an agricultural productive setting or it's like an ecosystem like you actually think of, so like a, you know, a rainforest ecosystem or a you know, human gut ecosystem. So that's you know, sort of the, I guess, the idea that underlies all of our projects. But um, yeah, so we have a range of projects. So we have um, work up in far north Queensland where we're trying to understand how microbes help create rainforest diversity, which I always think that one's really neat because it's such a simple question. Why are rainforests so diverse? Um, and you think we know well, the well, answer, but we don't. When you say diverse, <laughs> do you mean diverse in terms of the types of animal species and plant species or like where it lies at diversity? Yeah, yeah. So I'm talking specifically here about the actual plant diversity. So um, you think of most sort of plant um, plant communities, you're going to have maybe one or two dominant canopy species, whereas in the rainforest within a hectare, you can have up to 100 different species of canopy plant. And somehow they're all interacting with each other and in some kind of balance so that nothing ever really over dominates the others. And um, so we're working with this long term field site that's up in far north Queensland. It's been there for 50 years and they actually tagged the trees and have been following their life histories for that time right down to the little seedlings. And what they've realised is that, so in the seedling bank, you do have species that can dominate, but something happens between the seedling bank and the mature rainforest that sort of evens out the playing field and you wind up with this really diverse plant community. And the guys doing that research realised that the diversity happens right down when the plants are little. So somewhere in that sort of seedling to sapling stage. And there's a lot of evidence out there now that it actually could be soil microbes that are helping, you know, govern that diversifying process by sort of non-randomly killing off the stuff that looks dominant in the seedling bank, where it, but allowing the rare stuff to sort of grow unchecked. And in that way, you sort of strike this diversity in the plant community. That's why we get rainforests that look like they do. So that's... That's always really fun research if you can get up there and it's not raining when there's not when well, there's no leaves everywhere. <laughs> in in other environments, oh, all right. So first question: um, in a rainforest, then are they particularly resistant to invasive? Do they have invasive species? Like um, you know, they may be very diverse, which is great, but mm. um, do they have resistance to to change? Are they stable as well? The rainforest plant sp- communities. Yeah. Yeah, the entire rainforest itself, the plants, everything. Yeah. Yeah, no, look, they seem to be reasonably resistant to change. Um, there is a lot of, um, uh, you know, there are tropical invasive species, but largely they don't seem to be impacting our, certainly, our, they, you know, it's difficult for them to get a foothold within the mature rainforests, mostly because it's so dark in there. I mean, they're already really established communities and it's hard for something um, to take a foothold. Um, well, the reason I ask is maybe there's yeah. a trade-off. You know, they're, they're very yeah. diverse, but... 
the trade-off is uh, they could easily be disturbed, or maybe there's not that trade-off, you know? Um, yeah, well, it's inter- there could be, and it will be interesting to understand. There's, there's certainly life history trade-offs to being a rainforest plant, and um, it's interesting you say trade-offs because trait trade-offs is actually how we're interested in understanding these microbial communities. Um, I suspect the trade-off, and I'm not a plant ecologist here, um, may come in the re, you know, the re-establishment of the rainforest. So we know, um, you know, after a disturbance event, you get a very different looking sort of secondary rainforest, at least initially. And I suspect that's probably quite prone to change. And, um, you know, and so that's kind of one of the areas our research is in is we're st- with climate change, we're starting to see some of our rainforests catch fire, which isn't supposed to happen. They're notoriously... Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> so... Um, Rainforests are notoriously resistant to burning um, because they're so wet, but it's starting to happen that, you know, the dry season's lasting longer and the fires that are occurring in the regions are, you know, encroaching on the borders. I think not this year, but last year, there was a sizable portion of a um, Lamington National Park, which contains sort of a rainforest ecosystem that got burnt. And we don't know how they're going to recover after that. And we don't know. Um, how the soil microbial community would recover after that because these environments, they don't have a life history um, of dealing with fire like the rest of Australia seems to. Um, so that's actually yeah, one space that we're hoping to put this research into, understanding you know, the resilience and resistance to those kind of um, disturbances. Mm. Yeah, do rainforests go through, um, you know, some places, again, they'll burn and then a whole new forest will come. But rainforests, yeah. like, how do they cycle? Do they just slowly... Can you, you know, if you look at the fossil record or, you know, ancient ones, like, again, how do they cycle? How do they, uh, yeah, well, that's, they disappear? They're gone forever or what? Well, that's the kind of thing we don't really know. So, I mean, I think the Dane trees in the far north Queensland is one of the oldest rainforests in the world. And it just, it hasn't been burnt. So we don't know how it would. So the rest of Australia cycles really well with fire because it's adapted. Um, and, you know, the community that grows back after fire will look a bit different initially, but eventually return to what it was before. But we have absolutely no idea how our rainforests will cope with it. This is kind of, you know, a new frontier for them. So, yeah, it's a great question. It's one we're trying to hopefully trying to answer. Okay. And earlier when you were talking about um, a lot of plant diversity in your rainforest, maybe that's because, uh, I guess to put it simply, like life is easy. There's an abundance of, yeah. <laughs> of water and other nutrients and all that. So therefore the, you know, it's like the internet, you know, the, the yeah. bar is low to get on the internet and run a business. So <laughs> maybe it's like that in the rainforest and that why the, that's why there's more diversity, maybe in more difficult yeah, circumstances, yeah. only a few winners will emerge. You know? Yeah, I mean, possible, um, but it's not as easy as you would think. So certainly from a, the environment perspective, the rainforest is really conducive to plants. You've got, you know, limitless light and limitless water, as you say, but the competition within those plant communities, I think, can get pretty brutal. Um, you've not only got the plants, um, you know, they'll be competing chemically underground with their root systems, but the competition for light is brutal. So, um, you know, the canopy species that are up in the, you know, top of the rainforest, they're, they're fine, they can reach the light, but all the seeds that are germinating on that forest floor, they are effectively germinating in the dark. So the competition for light and able, being able to survive that environment, it's not an easy thing. So I guess if there's going to be a life history trade-off for a rainforest tree, it's going to be how its seeds and seedlings manage to survive in that, um, you know, while they're still small. So you know, I mentioned they've been tra- tracking the life history of those trees. So we know that there's stuff that's been there for 50 years that has grown about a foot. Still, It's still not even taller than my knee. So it looks like a sapling, but it's 50 years old. And these trees need to be able to survive, survive that environment for a really long time. So, so the, um... early on. Hmm? If you track, so I'm guessing there's parts of the rainforest, obviously, that have canopy, have no canopy. Um, if you're able to identify <clears throat> the life cycle of the rainforest, at least somewhat, and you look at parts of the forest that, I guess, quote, unquote, are newer or ones that are more mature, is the hmm. diversity the same in both? Like in, a, in, a, in an area with heavy canopy, is the diversity less or is it just the growth rate less? And in areas with very little canopy, maybe on the edge, is there less diversity? Is it, you know, I mean, what, what can you see that's different? Yeah, okay. So I qualify this with uh, I'm not a rainforest plant ecologist, but I, certainly there's research out there that compares old growth rainforests to sort of either that secondary rainforest um, or, you know, rainforest that's 
cycling faster because there's light. So there'll be um, areas along rivers or at the edge of the forest. Most of what we work with is the old growth stuff. So it's, it's dark everywhere. There's no, unless a tree falls down, there's no canopy gaps. Um, I suspect actually that in the, and you know, again, this is just my, as a microbial ecologist in the rainforest, what I've sort of absorbed from the other researchers I work with, I think actually that the, the areas where you have canopy gaps, well, three, not canopy gaps, but, you know, more access to light, you might actually have a bit less diversity because it gives an opportunity for one thing to get a foothold fast and take over, at least in the short term. It seems like in the old rain, in the old growth forest where the canopy is quite established, all of the canopy trees are sort of in some kind of, you know, balance that's happened over time. That makes sense. So I probably can't answer your question exactly, but yeah. Well, well, how about comparing these, um, these runts, these 50 year old uh, tree (laughs) runts, you know, they're only as high as your knee or not even Mm. to the big tall ones. Um, If you look at their, their microbiomes, essentially, that would be attached to them. What's that look like? We don't know yet. So that'll be a a really fun thing to do. So we've had a go at um, looking at the, microbes of the rhizosphere of rainforest plants and um, the problem with that the tricky bit is that the rainforest it's really just one big rhizosphere mat right so the interconnectivity between the root systems is such that it's really difficult to separate them out Um, however that said you know we've been able to sort of look around what we think is you know the rhizosphere zone of adult trees and there are a few trees out there that actually, despite the interconnectivity of the roots, seem to have a distinct rhizosphere. And I think that's related to the fact that they're actually pumping a lot of um, compounds into the soil that modulate the microbial community. Now, whether they're doing that um, for their benefit, which I suspect they might be, or whether it's more about them interacting with other plants, uh, we don't know yet. So that's actually something that we really want to look at. Well, what if you looked at, again, the, the, the run versus the regular tall trees and looked radially outwards Hmm. you you sample the microbes right near the roots of both and then you radially went outwards let's say to you know a foot you Hmm. probably see a very big difference maybe amongst the two but at least you know within a a specific one so even though you have an interconnected rhizosphere local stuff Hmm. will probably be important and different than uh, non-local yeah so um (laughs) yeah i think that would be an interesting experiment and we've tried to do things similar to that and I don't know what the difference between, you know, a rhizosphere of one of these sort of, we call them um, you know, academies, like little miniature statue academy awards, one of these little, um, um, <laughs> a care, right? A- academies stuck in the undergrowth, how its rhizosphere would differ from a giant tree. Um, but it would be a really interesting thing to look at. So we've, one of the problems we have with the rainforest microbiology, and it kind of feeds into sort of one of the ideas that underpins all the research in our lab is that the microbial communities in a rainforest, they don't, they're not just driven by the plants. There's a lot of um, environmental gradients, so pH gradients and things like that in the soil. And when you try and compare maybe a rhizosphere from a plant in one location to the rhizosphere from microbes in another location, um, the turnover in the species present in the soil is so great that it's been really hard to get a microbial signature. And you mentioned, um, you know, trait trade-offs before. And so what we've been trying to do is move beyond looking at the list of the microbes that are there and actually converting that information to the microbial traits, if this makes sense. So the idea, can we understand how a microbial community is functioning and what its ecology is based on the traits that that community exhibits rather than the species within it? And this has sort of helped us to start making comparisons Um, So for an example, so when we did start looking at um, the rhizosphere associated with these little seedlings, so in the rainforest often you have these dense patches of seedlings and our question was, you know, is that where the microbes are actively coming in and maybe non-randomly killing off these uh, seedlings that are diverse so that when you get to the canopy they're in balance with everything else. So we were interested in understanding if those microbial communities had something unique going on about them. And taxonomically, we couldn't actually compare the communities from three different seedling patches because they, the, the species turnover between them was just so great. But when we converted that information to thinking about traits, we were able to sort of start looking at um, a signature that was, seemed to be repeated, so repeating patterns of 
the traits that were enriched underneath these seedling patches. And it, the idea. What, what, do you, what do you mean by traits, by the way? If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. Yeah. Okay. That's a good question. Um, so for us, a trait is any physiological or uh, morphological attribute that helps um, an organism you know, be more fit, survive in a given environment. So for a microbe, that might be things like how motile is it? How much can it swim around? Um, can it produce antibiotics? Um, is it involved in biofilm production? What sort of metabolic pathways does it use or how many? Some microbes have um, multiple types of metabolism that they can link into. Um, and does it have um, sort of traits that are related to, um, sorry, efflux pumps and things and, uh, and receptors that are related to things like pathogenesis or, you know, and chemotaxis. So is it able to sense and move towards things in the environment? Now we can't easily measure that for every microbe in the soil, but we can sort of get a sense of is a given trait enriched in a particular community versus another. So when we started looking at things that way, it seemed to look like that underneath these seedling patches, there was an increase in sort of um, pathogen related traits. So this idea that when you've got a dense patch of seedlings, maybe what's happening is the microbes are sensing that and you're know, sensing feast and coming in and sort of actively killing off those small seedlings. And so you might have one or two survivors, but it stops them from becoming something dominant in the rainforest. But yeah, we could well, only if you look at it, um... Yeah, what if you look at it instead as like a job center and you look at metabolites instead, you know, what does that area need? What, what, what's like the common molecules that are traded back and forth by the different, you know, plants and microbes, et cetera, that help them live and look at it. Okay, well, there may be different microbes and species coming in, but they're still producing the same, you know, uh, molecules and metabolites that the, the other organisms in that area need. Again, looking yeah. at it as like a job center instead and different microbes can fill the jobs. <laughs> that's like yeah that's a really nice analogy um yeah so that's another strategy that we could use so we haven't del um delved into metabolomics but it would be interesting to see if we could do it that way as well so at the moment the traits that we're focusing on um they're a little bit useful because they sort of link to not only what the microbes are potentially doing but what they're adapted to deal with so um are they you know geared for competition or stress tolerance um and that's something that we use in our other research to sort of um get a handle on how you might manage and manipulate these microbial communities. If you know what something's adapted to do, you might be able to predict how it will, how it will change given a particular treatment or a, uh, or a management practice. So, well, what, what's, what are some other ways you've identified that you can look at the same environment? You know, again, I gave you the idea of like a job center, but are there other ways that uh, even if you haven't done it yet, how else could you look at it? Yeah. So I guess the, the other ways that we're looking at doing this is actually to um, incorporate ecological theory into our way of thinking. So microbial ecology, we have this uh, really interesting situation where up until very recently, we haven't really been able to look at a microbial community and get a handle on what it's actually doing because we haven't had sequencing technologies. Um, but now that we do, we can hope we can start moving beyond, you know, the list of names that we get back by our sequencing or genes or metabolites or, pro um, or proteins um, and see if we can incorporate theories that allow us to compare and classify uh, communities across different environments. And so while microbial ecologists haven't been really um, concentrated on doing that for a long time, you know, we couldn't, the rest of ecology has been doing that for a long time. So there's a lot of uh, ecological theory out there that's for comparing and understanding the ecology of a community. So what we've been doing is taking some of those theories and seeing if they can actually be applied to microbial communities. So a few years ago, we had a paper looking at phyto, uh, microbes used in phytoextraction. So phytoextraction is where you, um, you have a plant that's heavy metal tolerant. Um, and it's uh, adapted to actually draw heavy metals up out of the soil. And um, we've known for a long time in fire extraction research, if you have the right sort of microbes in that plant's rhizosphere, the whole, um, that there's a synergy between the plants and the microbes and the whole um, fire extraction. So the removal of the heavy metals from the soil um, can actually be sped up. Um, and so what we were trying to do was see if you can apply this ecological way of thinking to understand what's going on in that plant root zone. 
right? So what makes a heavy metal contaminated rhizosphere? How, you know, how does its ecology work? What does it do? Um, and by applying this way of thinking, we were actually able to um, identify you know, some really useful strategies for the phyto extraction field. So let me try and explain. Um, normally in phyto extraction, when you look for a microbe to add, you would intuitively think that the thing to find is a, a microbe that's heavy metal resistant because you want to add it to the soil and it needs to survive. And we know the soil is going to have a heavy metal in it. Um, but what we were able to do is look at those contaminated rhizospheres and determine that the actual, the main feature, the main ecology that underpins them wasn't actually stress tolerance, right? It was a microbe's competitive ability. That's what determined whether or not it was going to get into the rhizosphere and establish. And now, obviously, heavy metal tolerance is a bit important. You've still got that as a factor in the environment. But we were able to, but, you know, microbes vary in the way they deal with heavy metals. And what we identified was that there are a couple of classes of microbes, so the sphingomonadalias and the sphingobacteriales, that have altered cell walls. And it seems like maybe they were more efficient at dealing with um, toxicity due to well, cadmium was a heavy metal we were looking at specifically. So they didn't need to, um, so it seemed like they had a bit of an intrinsic resistance to it due to the unique structure of their cell wall. So it made them more competitive in that environment because they weren't diverting resources um, to trying to detoxify their cell. They were just able to grow. And indeed, they were the microbes that were starting to establish and take over in the contaminated rises. So what we found was this strategy that people have been using for you know, a couple of decades now to find a microbe to add in phyto extraction was on the right track, but a little bit flawed because we were looking for microbes that could survive in heavy metal contaminated environments. But what we actually needed to find was microbes that can survive and outgrow, so outcompete other microbes in that environment. So, yeah, that was a really so you, neat... So you mean it's not enough to just not be killed by a heavy metal contaminant? Absolutely. Um, you had to be better at not only surviving it, but maybe even utilizing it than your competition. Absolutely, yeah. So because, I mean, if you think about it, whenever we inoculate uh, a rhizosphere with a new microbe, that rhizosphere has already got a resident community there. You know, the community will be full. There's not going to be space for it. So if you want something to establish, um, it needs to be able to, it needs the tools to, to get a foothold. And in this case, um, that's its competitive ability. Absolutely. <clears throat> um, if you looked at a contaminated area and you did it longitudinally, you know, when there was first contamination introduced mm. and then a day later, a week later, a month later, what, what would you see in terms of the microbes that uh, come and predominate? Hmm. Good question. Let me think about that for a moment. What would we see? So you, so we're not thinking about plant rhizospheres, just the soil. We'd probably see initially after the contamination has occurred a reduction in the diversity as anything that's not adapted to that, um, you know, that contaminant sort of is killed out of the community. But um, nature abhors a vacuum. So probably what would happen is that something that's present in the community um, that can grow well, given those conditions, will bloom and sort of take over. That makes sense. So you would have a reduction in diversity, followed by um, you know, one or two microbes probably being able to increase in that niche. Which microbes they are, I couldn't say at this point. Um, and then, yeah, down the track, it would be a question of do those microbes manage to maintain their hold on that community? So there's a, a trade-off between being able to grow fast and being able to compete well. So after you've perturbed the environment with a contaminant, you might have the microbes that grow really fast take over because there's a space, but whether or not they're competitive enough to maintain their foothold for a long time um, will depend on what else is in the community and what adaptions they have. So those... Um, do you have, any, um, do you have yeah. any sense that um, microbes that are already there locally would first... I mean, of course, they would first attempt to uh, to get used to the contaminant, but uh, is it nomadic microbes that wander in from an outside area that appear to be more successful, or is it ones that are already there that adapt to become successful? Is there any preference, you think? Yeah, no, so, I, so most microbes in the soil um, have strategies to deal with contaminants. So they most of them have efflux, pump, efflux pumps to be able to remove heavy metals from their cell. So as you say, the local microbial community will be able to you know, survive and establish. My suspicion is over time what will happen is you'll get micro variation in the, um, in the adaptiveness 
of that community that's already there rather than have something else come along, you know, either being dispersed by the wind and being able to establish in that community. So unless, of course, someone gave it a, a big help along, you know, by actually inoculating it in droves. So I think it's actually quite hard for microbes in the soil, which is a pretty brutal environment for them really, um, to be able to disperse to and establish really well, certainly in a way that they would take over. I guess to make it even crazier, you consider <laughs> the, you know, the phageome, the phages that prey upon these microbes and, you know, if there's a contaminant and a microbe has to adapt and maybe mm-hmm. changes genes in order to, you know, or upregulate an efflux pump, it, it, maybe it's f- the phages that prey on it would change and therefore the yeah, microbe so- would change in other ways. Yeah, so that could be a really fascinating question. So we know that um, stress in the environment sort of does um, prompt microbes to share their DNA, their plasmid DNA a bit more. And a lot of the, and the reason for that is a lot of the heavy metal resistant elements are on those plasmids. So, and I'm sure that there are other mobile genetic elements also encoded on those plasmids and you know, including, we know, antibiotic resistance. Um, so, yeah, I think that could be a really fascinating question how, you know, the phageome responds to changes in the microbial community. I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just trying to make it so complicated. That, no, I know. I, I, I'm, I'm kind of teasing in a way because it gets so complicated. Like it does. Your eyes will, yeah. eyes will fall out of your head, you know, trying to figure it out. Oh, no. no. Um, yeah, no, the mind boggles every day when we try and um, get at the most simplest questions sometimes. Yeah, are there other are there, are there actors that um, appear to have large roles? Like, you know, you call it the rhizosphere, so... Mm. That tells me there's a lot of, uh, you know, fungi that have roles as well, not just the uh, microbes. So, had, you know, has there been any consideration to them or, again, too complex? Or, you know, what have you looked at in, in terms of their relationship with the microbes and the plants? Yeah, no, so it's, it is complex, but it's, I think, where the field is heading. So understanding how these different aspects of the microbial community you know, are able to interact and play off one another. And that's, you know, not just bacteria and fungi, but the phageome, as you've mentioned, and, you know, so also protozoa, which will prey on bacteria. So they're sort of, you know, like the predators of the microbial world. I mean, they do other things too, but um, they often also trim and prune the bacterial community. Um, in terms of sort of the heavy metal contamination, it's quite interesting because it seems that the, the fungal and the bacterial components of the community behave very differently. So fungi seem to be more intrinsically resistant to dealing with heavy metals. So if you, um, you asked before what happens after you you know, contaminated environment, the bacterial community changes a lot, but the response of the fungal community seems to be a lot slower and a lot more muted. And, um, yeah, so we don't know at this point what that means in terms of how they play off one another, but it would be an interesting thing to look at. Hmm. Okay. What, um, are there any tools coming online that you think are really going to shed light on all the different experiments you could do? Any other omics that are coming or, you know, any big movers that have improve things? Yeah. Um, So I mentioned before looking at microbial traits, right? Um, So they can be accessed through the DNA. So you can take the the metagenome and think about the traits that are there. Uh, But a really useful tool that's out there is actually being developed by a lab that I saw you've interviewed on another podcast, the Langara Lab. And that's that um, that tool is called PyCrust. And the reason it's really useful is it takes, um, so the 16S metabarcoding, that is often done, which relative to metagenomics is much cheaper, which is why it's you know, so widely used. And it predicts the traits. So the reason it needs to do prediction is when you're doing the, um, the 16S sequencing, you're really just getting the name of the bacteria. You're not sequencing anything else in its genome. But using the massive amounts of information that we're accumulating out there, so we've got big um, metagenome repositories that are being built, um, PyCrust sort of links in with that and predicts the traits of your community based off 16S sequencing. Um, so there's that, but then there's also metagenomics, which is um, equally relevant, but much more expensive to do. So I think people that are going to come up with ways to look at the microbial traits of a community in a controlled way. So that um, PyCrust is sort of just the start of it. It's accessing them, not necessarily categorizing what the traits are about and what they're for. Um, is going to be a way forward in the community, uh, in the microbial ecology sphere. So with the reason for that is, you know, is you can use traits to compare across a diversity of different microbial communities. So traits aren't necessarily conserved across phylogenetically related taxa. They can be, but they're not necessarily. But it means you can compare, um, but they're, you know, they're conserved, a big part, across microbes that have a similar life history. 
So it's a way that you can take micro, uh, microbial communities that look completely different on the taxonomic level and actually start finding repeating patterns in them, even if they've got no species in common. Um, so this, that's something we're developing in our lab. And I know I'm not alone in that because I've seen in the last two years a, a suite of papers emerge that are looking at trying to understand the microbial traits in a whole lot of different environments. So including, you know, how microbes um, establish and succeed in, say, the infant gut, you know, so how our microbiome develops. Um, people are looking at this in terms of agriculture and agricultural management practices. Um, I really do think that I haven't seen, like, the specific technology related to, um, you know, classifying and, and categorising traits. Maybe we'll develop it if we, if we find time. We're working on it. But I think that's actually going to be a really cool way forward um, for microbial ecology in general. So moving yeah. beyond names and thinking about, I mean, traits are really asking what is that, what is the community doing, not just who's there. Well, I think you have to. I've, I've heard from a number of people. Um, a friend of mine worked for the FDA for a long time and now CDC. Mm -hmm. And the, he said, like, if you consider even like E. coli in our guts, yeah. it's not just one thing called E. coli. Yeah. There's so many yeah. variations of it that, it's hard to even call a bacteria a certain species or strain. You know? Yeah, exactly. The species, so concept, the species concept absolutely seems to start breaking down for bacteria. It's, um, yeah. So that's why we're interested in moving beyond the names, as you say, to trying to understand what the community is doing. Yeah, so yeah. I'd say that's the future. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jen, what, what's the best way for people to find out more about your work and your lab's work? Yeah, okay. So... You can find me on Latrobe's website. Um, so we all have a Scholar One profile there, but I have a, a personal website that you'll be able to find, um, a WordPress website, but probably the best way to find me is on Twitter. So I'm a soil microbial ecologist, so my Twitter is, handle is uh, JW underscore I like dirt, all one word. And, um, yeah, that's probably the best way to find me and connect with me. Um, our lab has a Twitter account as well, uh, which is you know, linked to mine. And, you know, we're publishing our updated research on there and any fun events that happen. So, yeah, social media, way of the future. Okay. Uh, very good. <laughs> Jen, thanks for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. No, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.